Okay, uh, good morning. Um, we're here from the University of Cambridge, um, and this is a, a little project which we, which we worked on recently. Um, based on Stanford's password hash. So I'm just going to explain a little bit about what Stanford password hash is um, and why we took a look at it. Uh, so it's actually based in a 2005 uh, Usenix paper. Um, the main goal of password hash is to, uh, well, one of the things they're trying to mitigate actually is uh, the impact of phishing attacks. Uh, say you uh, click on a cross-site scripting link, you end up getting taken to, uh, to, a, to an evil website. Uh, you enter your password, which is the same password which you reuse across a whole lot of sites. Um, the evil, evil actor uh, obtains your password and they, they can use that on all the other sites which you, which you use. Um, the goal of password hash is to try to guarantee that you don't use the same password on every site. And it does this by mangling your password uh, using, the, using the site domain um, in, a, in, a, in a clever way um, with the goal of ensuring that the, the target site never actually learns your, your master password. And this is the original paper. Um, back in 2005, this was written. Uh, this has a strong, uh, a strong bias on the sort of technical implementation of actually a browser extension which supports password hash. It doesn't go into too much detail about uh, the, 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 the whys or the, or the reasons for, for, uh, for doing this sort of approach in the first place. Um, and it, it, it's very based in, uh, in mitigating various sorts of browser attacks and this sort of thing. Um, so if you want to know a little bit more about password hash, um, go and have a read of this paper. So when we, um, we didn't realize there was only one microphone, so there's going to be a bit of dancing involved, I'm afraid, I suspect, as we go through. Um, so yeah, so, um, so password hash is not the only example of a client-side uh, hashing mechanism, um, and it's been developed into various other examples as well. So, um, so for example, Passpet uh, was a soups paper in 2006. Um, password hash plus plus, which is a development of password hash, uh, which, was, um, uh, which was a 2011 paper. Um, and uh, Rand Phrase, which we were contacted about after we had uh, submitted our paper uh, for the conference for Passwords 2016, um, is actually a, a, a similar sort of tool that's being developed by um, a guy called Ronnie uh, Lins, uh, Linsgaard uh, at the University of Copenhagen, uh, uh, that's also trying to uh, use um, client-side password hashing uh, to improve people's passwords. So it's not an idea that's uh, going away, it's an idea that um, is, in, is in current use. Uh, and the actual password hash implementations, uh, there's a website, the Stanford University website has, a, has an implementation on that you saw on the first slide. Uh, there's also Android versions, so this is a version, uh, the picture is a version um, that's made by Philip Wolf. it's an Android version, it was last updated February last year. And the uh, Firefox plugin was updated this year in April thereabouts. So it's, a, it's an actively developed mechanism for uh, supporting passwords. Okay, so we'll have a look at how password hash actually works. <coughs> um, to guarantee that your, your password is, is never known, your master password is never known to the target website, it takes your master password. Um, it takes the site URL, um, and optionally, it takes a user-specified salt. Um, now, interestingly, uh, this user-specified salt uh, is mentioned in the paper. Uh, it didn't actually make it into the, uh, the production implementation of password hash. Um, it would have solved uh, a lot of problems, and it would have helped to mitigate some of the attacks, which we'll, we'll look at in, in a short while. Um, so essentially, it takes your password. Uh, it takes uh, some parts of the site URL. Um, and it actually uses HMAC MD5 um, inside. Um, for example, if you take this password, correct was battery staple, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, um, and you're trying to log into LinkedIn.com, what it will do uh, in its default configuration, and, and this is actually uh, changeable by the user. Um, most people won't bother to do this. Uh, it'll take the top two domains um, and use those uh, as a salt, um, essentially, to, um, to guarantee that you've got a, a unique password for this site. 
and this is an example hash uh, once it's gone through HPAC MD5. <laughs> And by coincidence, that's your password, right? <laughs> no. You're not using password hash. <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, what are the perceived benefits? Um, of course, the user thinks that they get a password which is unique to each site. Technically, that's sort of true. Um, it's got a mix of characters. Um, if you actually have a look at this, it looks like a super strong password. That's what's, um, that's what's going to be sent. Um, nice and long. Um, the user isn't burdened with having to remember anything particularly complicated. Um, and obviously it's very, very hard to guess. Um, of course, by using the, the target domain uh, as a salt, um, it's a really nice way to guarantee that you get a, a, a unique hash for each site uh, without having to remember too much or set up any sort of configuration in the browser as well. Um, so some, some nice features and some, some nice design goals. Um, so yeah, it's very lightweight. Uh, you don't have to configure anything in the browser. Um, there is a browser plugin available, and there's also uh, a website. If you go to uh, passwordhash.com, uh, I think, you're going to see uh, uh, a little um, section on that website where you can, uh, you can test the algorithm um, and just cut and paste the password if, if you don't have access to the browser plugin. Um, and that was also one of the, the design goals in the original paper, uh, was to make sure that people didn't have to install any sort of plugin as well. Um, Can I take this? Thank you. Uh, so, I, I apologise for putting JavaScript on a slide this early in the morning. Um, <laughs> There should be some kind of punishment, I admit. Um, but I'm just going to go through it briefly because it, it's, it's actually quite, um, uh, I think it's actually quite um, uh, useful to understand exactly what password hash is doing in the background. Um, so you can see that it's, it's, it, this is the password it's trying to generate, and it's taking the master password and the domain as the inputs, uh, and that goes through to this function here. And what essentially is the main part of it is that it takes a base64 HMAC MD5 of the two together. So that's essentially the data that it's working with, and those passwords that we've seen on previous slides are essentially base64 HMAC MD5 um, hashes. However, it does some other things. It, it adds two to the length of the password, so the final password it generates is going to be two longer than the password that the user puts in, the master password. So that gives the user a little bit of control about how large the password output is. Uh, and it also determines whether or not there's a non-alphanumeric character in the, in the original password. Uh, and it puts that through to this constraint function, which initially takes four off the length, because what it's going to do is put four characters back on the length in order to satisfy some criteria in order to get through password filters. <coughs> so it takes four characters off, and it's going to put them back on again, uh, which is what it's doing in lines 18 to 23. And here you can see what it's doing is it says, um, add on an extra character, and it pulls the next character from the hash, and it essentially munges it into a, into a capital letter. It subtracts the capital A from it, it, does, it moduluses it by 26, it adds capital A back on, and then you've got a letter that's definitely, it's not, it's not always capital A, it will be a capital letter based on the hash uh, the value that it pulls from, from its list of characters. So it adds on a capital letter, it then adds on a lowercase letter, and adds on a number using the same technique. And then finally, if you've put a non-alphanumeric non character in the password that you put in at the beginning, it then, you can see there's this if statement here, it then adds a non-alphanumeric character onto the end. So that guarantees that it's got at least one capital, at least one lowercase, at least one number, and then, depending on what you input, at least one non-alphanumeric character. And then finally, it uh, rotates it by pulling another letter from its, its stash and rotating it by that amount, and that essentially means that that non-alphanumeric character gets rotated around to somewhere else in the password. Uh, so it produces these rather nice random passwords. Uh, so the real reason I put this up, though, is because HMAC MD5s are, um, uh, uh, where is it generating it up here, are 16-byte values, which amounts to 22 base64 characters. So if it runs out of letters at the end, it's essentially just pulling zero bytes off the stack, and it doesn't mitigate that. So if your character goes over 20, if your password goes over 22 characters, uh, you end up just with these, these, these zero bytes coming off. And you can see what happens uh, in that case with the outputs that you actually get from the system. 
Uh, so, pulling all of that together, what we end up is, here's a few examples. Uh, you can see that if we just use, a, uh, we use a, a site, the highlighted bits are the bits that it actually uses to put into the domain for, to generate the password. And we use a password, a master password, that doesn't have alphanumerics, then we get this nice looking password that also doesn't have any alphanumerics, but has all of the other characteristics. Um, if we put a star in, a non-alphanumeric, then we get a completely different password, but now you can see it's got this forward slash in, so it's added in that character to give a non-alphanumeric, and hopefully that's going to get through your filter. Uh, as you can see, if we change the subdomain, it makes no difference. Uh, if we change the domain, then it completely changes the password. And as we increase the password length, so the password that's generated increases as well, until we hit this limit of 22 characters, this is a 23 character master password, and then we get these A's being tagged on the end, and the rotation fails as well, because that's putting in a zero byte as well. Uh, so as you go over 22, you just get these long passwords with letter A's at the end. So um, it's a kind of a minor flaw in the implementation, it's not in the original paper, but that simplifies the way that you can crack these things. Uh, whilst we're on this page, actually, I just want to, uh, to point something else out, uh, which I mentioned earlier. Um, in the default configuration, it's only using the, the top-level domain and, and the domain underneath it. Um, that is configurable. Uh, if you want to start hacking around with it, uh, you could use you know, three domains, four domains. Um, but in its default implementation, it's only using these, these two domains. Um, a lot of people don't realize this, and certainly if you're just using the password hash website to generate hashes, that's, that's a problem. Uh, for example, um, if you need to log into lots of websites under .gov.uk, um, maybe you've got a thousand accounts at local councils all, all over the country, uh, you'll find that all your hashes are the same uh, if you're using the same master password, uh, because they all come under this umbrella of .gov.uk. Um, so certainly in those sorts of situations, if you're operating under a, a big umbrella domain, uh, you're going to want to make sure that you modify those default uh, settings so that you use more and more subdomains. Um, so, what's the problem? Um, there was an excellent talk yesterday um, uh, looking at uh, how these things happen in, in, in the wild. Um, excellent survey there. Um, have, have I been pwned? Um, 1.3 uh, billion compromised accounts. I think some of those have been released uh, recently, so you can use that data uh, in your own research. Um, 46 significant database dumps per day. Um, obviously, it's a huge problem. Uh, password compromise is, is, is an enormous problem. Um, and password reuse just, just compounds that. Um, huge problem. We're all very familiar with, with the background here. Thank you. Uh, so, yeah, so we were interested to know whether or not... Um, we were interested to know whether you, you have all of these leaks, all of, the, uh, all of the passwords are hashed, and then you get this great software like uh, Hashcat or John the Ripper that is uh, designed to rip through those passwords and, and, and recover the passwords from the hashes. And we were interested to know whether that was possible with password hash as well, because these passwords that it are generating, they look really great. They seem like they're gonna pass through the filters, they look like they've got high entropy, they look like really good passwords, but in practice, are they actually secure against some of the attacks that happen? Um, so, um, this is obviously background. Um, this is a picture of, uh, not exactly your oh, dog, but it's... This is Boris, yeah. <laughs> He's not my dog, but I get to hang out with him from time to time. So, if you know all this stuff, uh, look at the dog. Um, so, the idea is that uh, uh, in the background, in the, uh, the databases, uh, they'll be hashing these passwords, uh, hopefully using a salt. Uh, they'll put the password in, and this is the, the value that will be stored. So, the... the oops, sorry. Clicking the wrong button. Uh, uh, so the value that's stored will be the salt along with a hash of the password and the salt. And um, um, the idea is that with password hash, of course, you're not storing the password here, you're storing some variant of the password, and we want to know whether that can be recovered as well. Uh, is this me? This is me. Uh, okay, so, um, so the purpose of, of adding in the salt is that it prevents you using rainbow tables uh, or um, uh, lists of pre-existing hashes. Um, and if you want to reverse the hashes, you have to go through all of the possibilities. You have to do brute force, and we saw that uh, yesterday as well um, in, um, in David's talk about how that can be achieved uh, very well with password cracking or recovery tools. 
Um, and nowadays, because uh, salting is used, rainbow tables aren't as effective. And so what the implementers, some of whom are in the room today, uh, do is they use uh, massive parallelization to improve the speed at which these things can be hashed, uh, can be hashed like, uh, uh, for example, using GPUs, um, which um, have lots of cores to be used. Um, and the GPUs aren't necessarily fast themselves, but because they have this massive parallelization and because the, uh, because the nature of password hashing is it, it, it can benefit from that, uh, you can get very good results from them. Uh, so we looked at using Hashcat to break uh, the password hash, uh, hashes. Um, and uh, one of the reasons we looked like that is because looked at it is because it's incredibly fast. It's an incredibly good implementation. Uh, there was uh, a paper by Ruddick and Yan uh, recently published at Usenic so that looked at the um, looked at the way uh, password hash works, um, and they produced results where they were using a Radeon uh, HD six eight seven zero, which has uh, just over a thousand uh, stream processors running at about <coughs> nine hundred megahertz, and they were getting uh, one point four giga uh, hashes per second. Um, uh, for SHA-1 hashing, that's unsalted SHA-1 hashing. Uh, so that's pretty fast. Uh, Jeremy Gosney of Sagita of the, um, of the Hashcat team, uh, he allows you to buy these incredible um, machines, which I, I suspect all of you are already familiar with. Um, if you want to put down $20,000, uh, 20, you can buy an eight, uh, an eight graphics card uh, GTX Titan machine, which will churn through 48 giga hashes per second. That is an incredible quantity. So I put these up partly because these numbers absolutely astonish me. Um, so that'll get through a 12 character SHA-1 password. It'll try every single possibility of the 12 characters in just under 12 hours. Um, so it feels like you're not very safe uh, even with a 12 character password. Um, so yeah, so we wanted to use this to try and see if we could, uh, we could break these, these password hash uh, passwords. Okay, um, clearly, um, with a, uh, certainly with a, with a password hash, um, a password submitted to a website, scanning the entire password space is, is, is a big problem. Um, classically, we can use various kinds of attack. Um, I'm sure if you've if you played around with Hashcat or any other sort of password cracking slash recovery slash um, auditing tool, um, th then you'll be familiar with uh, some of these types of approach. Um, unfortunately, the, the password hash passwords aren't really susceptible to these attacks. Um, there is a really nice um, jumble of characters in there. Um, there, there aren't uh, obvious clear patterns which, which we can attack. Um, and actually, the, the space is quite huge. Uh, so we have to, have to try something a little bit more sneaky. So the, um, the solution that we use to do this is rather than attack the password that's being stored on the server, we attack the master password that the user put in because that is susceptible to all of these uh, clever rules that, that, that reduce the password space to, that needs searching through. So the normal way that something like password hash would work is that it would, uh, it would uh, look at the leaked pass hash that was taken from the leaked database. Uh, it would choose its password based on its rules. It would hash it using the hash that we saw earlier, adding in the salt from the leaked file as well, if there is one, uh, and then compare the two results to see whether or not they match. If they match, then it's recovered the password. So we introduced the password hash step into that process. Uh, so rather than just hashing the password based on the leak, we also perform the, H, uh, the, the base 64 HD uh, MD5 HMAC as well as part of the step. So we take the password that comes out of the rules, we hash it using this uh, MD5 HMAC and apply essentially that JavaScript code to it um, and, then, and then pass that into the hash uh, that is used on the website. And if the comparison then works, then we have a match for the master password. So obviously this adds in additional steps into the process, so we're interested to know whether that had a bigger impact on performance. One of the problems is that Hashcat does a lot of really interesting optimizations in order to make this process faster. So for example, um, if only the first four bytes of the password are changing, then you can use a meet in the middle attack with something like MD5, and this is implemented in the current version um, of uh, Hashcat. So uh, if you're going through passwords in an order that you know, you can arrange it so that only the first four characters are changing and the last part of the password is staying the same. So this is one 32-bit word that's changing. And in MD5, that 32-bit word isn't actually used in the last 15, uh, 15 cycles of the calculation. So you can reverse those cycles back up from, the, from using the other values, which are staying the same. And then when you calculate uh, from the top down again, you stop 
uh, before you get to, uh, at the end where the two meet. And if the two are different, then you know that your password uh, isn't going to fulfill the final hash. And so you can stop the process there. And you can keep these last 15 steps of the calculation the same for every four characters change that you use, as long as the rest stay the same. So that's one really nice optimization using a meet in the middle attack. Similarly for SHA-1, uh, the very first step of doing a SHA-1 is to extend your 512-bit uh, input into this 2560-bit input. And you do that essentially by XORing the values together in various ways and rotating them. So you can form all of those XORs and the rotations without using the first, uh, the first word. And you can just add that word in later on when you go through the, all of the possible combinations. Now that's great. That works really well. It's a really nice optimization if your first characters aren't changing are, are the only ones that are changing but of course with us um, with us it's more than the, um, because we push it through the password hash step that's no longer the case so we have a really nice list of passwords with only a small amount changing that gets pushed through and hashed to produce something where everything is changing so essentially uh, we had to go through and rip out all of the really nice opti optimizations that were being performed by hashcat and we were concerned that this would have a big impact on the efficiency of the process uh, so this is the standard process. What we end up with uh, is uh, initially the, the original process with Hashcat would be that you perform the pre-step, the base step where you do these pre-calculations. You then go into a loop where you update the password one character at a time uh, or four, these first four characters at a time. You then do the main loop and if you have a match then you're done. If you don't then you go around this tighter loop instead. Um, so for us we had to pull in some of the optimizations back into that tighter loop to make the tighter loop uh, more expanded uh, and produce a slightly slower result as a consequence. So we couldn't use the same optimizations, unfortunately, for the process. So we were concerned that this would have a big impact on the, the performance uh, of what we we're doing. Uh, so we were interested to know. We thought we'd try it out some, on some hashes to find out whether that was the case or not. OK, uh, so uh, we tried to target some, uh, some of the, the, the big breaches in, in recent history within the last sort of five, six years. Uh, so we've got stratfor.com, we've got rootkit.com, we've got linkedin.com, all of which hemorrhaged uh, large numbers of hashes, um, unsalted hashes, in fact, in, in all three cases. Um, stratfor.com, um, anyone who's not familiar with that, it's a sort of uh, global intelligence uh, website. You can subscribe to news feeds, probably if you work in insurance and sort of any sort of risk management, then, then you may well have an account on stratfor.com. Um, they lost whoa, about 822,000 um, hashes uh, back in 2011. Um, the FBI did, with some assistance, uh, catch up with the chap who did that. Um, uh, hacktivist, of course, so um, published all this stuff on the internet. Hacktivists are great for research because they just give these things away um, rather than trying to sell them. Um, in this case, it was unsalted MD5 hashes. Uh, so clearly, rainbow table attacks are going to be very, very successful. Um, this best effort is based on what we can understand from, uh, from other people's um, efforts and, uh, and lists of cracked passwords. They're looking about 93%, which is, which is not atypical in this sort of situation. Um, and we were cracking um, one hash about every uh, 11 milliseconds. Um, so MD5, um, rather easy to, to attack. Um, and we only found one instance of somebody using password hash on strat4.com. Um, and we'll have a look at the example password in a short while. Um, rootkit.com, um, what is that? Uh, uh, well, actually, this, this breach was closely related to the HB Gary attack, um, if you're familiar with that. Uh, so a bunch of hackers um, exploited actually a SQL injection uh, vulnerability. Uh, in the content management system of HP Gary's website. Um, it's a funny story because the reason we have all these passwords is actually due to password reuse issues. Um, what happened is they, they compromised the content management system, uh, got a lot of um, unsalted MD5 uh, hashes from that, um, which they promptly cracked using rainbow tables and all this sort of thing. Um, uh, that password reuse um, uh, unfortunately, there was some password reuse, and they were able to get the, uh, the, uh, the administrator account for the, for the Google email for, for the whole company. Um, and they were able to read some emails, uh, get some, uh, some useful information which would help them in a social engineering attack, 
and ultimately they were able to persuade an administrator of this rootkit.com uh, affiliated site um, uh, to change uh, some passwords and basically just give them access. Uh, so password reuse actually caused rootkit.com to be compromised um, and that was using unsorted MD5 hashes as well. Um, both these attacks are attributed to um, campaigns run by uh, the, the infamous anonymous group. Um, and again, being unsorted MD5 hashes, we were cracking, I don't know, uh, one hash every result, 11 milliseconds. Um, and we found three, uh, three instances of, of people using uh, password hash uh, for accounts on rootkit.com. Um, probably security uh, sensitive people, I would think, with accounts on rootkit.com, um, as indeed you would expect on strat4.com. Uh, so maybe not unsurprising that they're using something like password hash. Um, LinkedIn.com, um, that provided us with a lot more hashes to have a look at, and uh, we got, a, got much better results from that. Um, LinkedIn.com, again, using unsalted hashes, uh, unsalted char1, very, very bad. Um, previous best efforts are around sort of 70, 80% mark. Um, slightly slower hash, we're cracking maybe about uh, 40 milliseconds password. Uh, and in 28 seconds, we found about 75 people who were using um, password hash on LinkedIn.com. Uh, lots of IT professionals on LinkedIn.com, lots of, lots of academics on LinkedIn.com. Um, I'm on LinkedIn.com. Um, Probably you'd expect people to be in touch with a technology like password hash uh, in, a, in a situation like that. Um, incidentally, uh, I might explain this, this weird number up here. Um, the number of hashes which we actually worked on uh, was nearly three million. Uh, the actual complete hash dump contains more, more than six million hashes. Um, in, the, in the commonly available um, ethically sourced fair trade version of this, uh, of this password dump, um, about half the hashes have uh, the first uh, couple of bytes zeroed out. And the common analysis is that these were easily cracked passwords, um, which had already been cracked. Uh, so you would expect probably the last three million to be slightly, slightly harder passwords um, or slightly more complex passwords. Um, so yeah, we only worked on about half those, those hashes. Um, and we found 75 people using, using password hash in that group. Uh, the hardware we use, because we're, we're impoverished researchers, um, we don't have a massive GPU rig on our desk, um, we spend about uh, 65 cents an hour uh, to rent an Amazon uh, G2 instance. And this comes with uh, a grid K520. Uh, you can pick these up for probably less than 2,000 euro. Um, lots of these things flying around on, on eBay. Uh, it's not a cutting edge card. Um, so if you do want to uh, stick one of these in your desktop, uh, that's probably within reach of a lot of people. Um, or you can just go on Amazon and rent one very, very cheaply. Um, no point probably in spending huge amounts of money building a GPU rig uh, unless you're going to do this all day long. Um, 65 cents an hour is quite reasonable if you just want to do this sort of thing occasionally. Uh, so as I said before, we were concerned about whether or not our changes would have a big <coughs> impact on um, the actual speed of, of hash cracking. Um, and um, uh, I have to say, um, uh, we're not GPU programmer experts. We were just trying to pull something together that we could find out would work. Uh, but we were rather surprised with the results. Um, uh, so, um, uh, so this is a graph of the, of the values that we found. Um, these first uh, five values, sorry, the first uh, six values, I beg your pardon, are using Hashcat's automatic benchmarking tool, uh, whereas the last three are using actual data, which is one of the reasons for the big discrepancy in speed between, between the two sets. Um, but just, I just want to uh, sh uh, w um, talk through these because they are a little bit surprising and I couldn't really figure out what was going on. Um, so for MD5, um, the values that we were getting um, were around about, um, what is this? This is about uh, two uh, thousand megahertz per second of hashes, so two, three, one, six megahertz per second for plain MD5. When we added in the password hash process, so this extra step that's doing an additional MD5 HMAC, uh, we found that the speed actually increased. So we weren't really expecting that um, to about 2,400 uh, 2, megahertz. Uh, so that, that seems a little bit odd to us. 
Uh, and we tried the same thing with SHA-1 as well. And as you can see in the numbers here, uh, for SHA-1, uh, it was about it was 616 megahertz without our additional code and with the optimizations removed, uh, uh, optimizations included, I beg your pardon. Uh, when we removed the optimizations and added in this extra step, the speed actually increased to 645 megahertz, uh, mega hashes per second. So that was a little bit surprising. We weren't really sure what was going on. So then um, I thought, I, I thought it, it seems a little bit odd. Let's add it into the HMAC MD5 one. And that way it's essentially doing double the work. The password hash step is uh, doing an HMAC MD5. And then the hashing that's assumed at the, at the, at the um, database end is also an HMAC MD5. Um, and then we got results which seemed a little bit more expected. So you can see here, uh, there's, hey, oh, sorry. There's HMAC MD5. Uh, that is running at uh, 780 megahertz, uh, mega hashes per second. Uh, when we add in the password hash step, it goes down by a factor of 10. So that's a really big shift in the speed. Um, so uh, we couldn't really figure this out. But luckily, being at passwords, we were able to talk to Jan Stobe yesterday, uh, who is the, uh, the main developer of Hashcat. Uh, and he explained to us a little bit about how the optimization works. Uh, apparently, this is not exceptional uh, behavior. This is perhaps what you might expect to see. Um, so the compiler, the OpenCL compiler that compiles the GPU code um, for the graphics card, uh, is doing some really aggressive optimizations. And essentially, the speed is very much dependent on the registers um, that are on your graphics card. If you run out of registers, um, then um, the uh, optimizations will start using the shared memory and the speed will go down massively. Uh, so what essentially we see in the first two cases is where the graphics, uh, where the, uh, the compiler is doing these massive optimizations, these really aggressive optimizations, and actually producing very clean, tight code as a result. Um, but as soon as you run out of registers with the, with the double HMAC MD5, uh, probably because of my poor implementation, um, you then get this massive hit in speed. And so um, the, the objective then would be to try and optimize that by making sure that the shared memory isn't used and the registers can, can be used instead. So we were very surprised with the results, but apparently this is, uh, this is normal. Um, Graham's already talked about the speed of the, uh, of the actual um, practical uh, case. So with Strat4, Rootkit, and LinkedIn, you can see we were getting around about 40 uh, um, million hashes per second uh, going through. Uh, it's a big difference because it's using real data, but it's still actually uh, very fast and producing very good results, we felt. Video. We have a video. <coughs> this is just a video of uh, the Amazon EC2 instance um, chomping on some uh, some LinkedIn hashes. Um, this is just a straight attack. Um, nothing too fancy, and we're using the Rocky uh, list, obviously. Um, and we're using the best 64 rule set, because um, that's quite handy. Um, so no magic here. We did do some other things, some toggle case attacks, that sort of thing. Uh, didn't come up with a huge number of extra results. Um, if you want to have a go yourself, um, and you want to try some, uh, some more laborious attacks, then you may well find a lot more um, uh, password hash passwords in the LinkedIn dump. Um, but we didn't do any super magic. Uh, mostly we were relying on the best 64 rule set and some, and some rather simple approaches. Um, oh, okay, uh, so these are some of the... Uh, some of the passwords which were recovered. Um, the single password that we found on strat4.com, and bear in mind that we didn't spend, uh, we didn't spend weeks trying to crack these passwords. Uh, we, we spent a, a couple of hours uh, trying, to, trying to crack these passwords using very simple techniques uh, and some of the built-in rule sets which ship with Hashcat. Um, so if you, if you wanted to really go to town on this, you'd probably find uh, a lot more. Um, frog dog, does that seem like a good password? Not really. Um, apparently it's the name of a, a slang name of a breed of dog. I think it's a Something from the Star Wars universe as well. Um, maybe this person was a, was a Star Wars fan. Who knows? Um, obvious to most people in this room, I, I would hope. Um, really, really bad password. Clearly, uh, it's a dictionary word. Um, rootkit.com. Maybe you'd expect people to be using slightly better passwords. Um, uh, but 
clearly not. Um, have no idea what this is. It's a prime number. Um, fairly, fairly random. Um, Erpland is the name of a name of a, a, a rock band's album. Uh, so it's clearly a music fan. Um, if we look at some of the LinkedIn hashes, uh, we have all, all the usual suspects. Uh, we've got this uh, keyboard walk here, um, 1938, apparently the first year that Superman comic was, was printed. Um, you can see one of the rules, uh, one of the first rules in that best 64 set uh, capitalizes the first letter of, of this word, which was, was, was helpful. Um, fruitcake with some, with some litification and the capitalized first letter. Again, it's not rocket science to crack that sort of password, but probably to the untrained eye, it looks like a strong password. Um, Midaprac01, uh, that's a common phrase, carpe diem, spelt backwards with a number on the end. Um, this is probably somebody's, probably somebody's date of birth um, or some important life event. Um, and really bad, <laughs> we actually found somebody using the password LinkedIn, um, which was, of course, being sorted with the domain LinkedIn.com and used to protect their LinkedIn account. So um, that's about as bad as it gets, I think. Um, but actually, uh, to anyone that uh, spends any time looking at passwords, which is everyone here, um, it's not a completely unsurprising result. Um, so uh, we don't just like to break stuff, uh, we like to fix things as well. Um, so we've, uh, we've augmented password hash or, or, or re-implemented re -implemented, uh, some of the, 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 the poorer features. Um, so in our version we, we end up using pbkdf <coughs> sha SHA-512. Um, uh, there's a, a user configurable salt, which was actually mentioned in the original Stanford paper, but uh, never implemented. Um, the downside to this is the user has to configure this in every browser that they use. Um, but it does make things lots, uh, lots more secure. One of the problems with, with the whole approach is that we know what the salt is because we know where the, the leaked passwords came from. Um, we know if we get a, a hash dump from LinkedIn.com that we're probably looking at people using linkedin.com uh, as the salt if they're using password hash, certainly if they haven't changed the, uh, the default configuration. Um, this user configurable salt uh, will be unknown to the attacker, uh, and this is just concatenated uh, in the process. So uh, we also have a configurable number of iterations. Um, David's fixed the, uh, the hash overrun bug, which, uh, which he mentioned earlier. Um, and what we'd like to do is definitely emphasize the importance of a strong master password. Um, your site password still has to be very good um, because it is possible to do these sorts of offline attacks. Uh, so what we've seen is users are trying to um, or, or expecting password hash to, uh, to give them some extra level of obscurity and they're not really thinking about uh, what its design goals were. Um, and the way they're using it is not very secure. Um, really do need to emphasize that if you are using password hash uh, or you intend to at some point in the future or any similar system, um, you still need to choose a strong master password. Uh, LinkedIn is, is not acceptable <laughs> as a password in this field. I, I wanted to add that as well because um, something that re the reviewers um, uh, pointed out, which I thought was a very good point, which is that, of course, password hash also allows you to get around uh, the filtering of a website. So LinkedIn would never be accepted as a password on a website normally. Uh, it doesn't have the right uh, combinations. But by putting it through password hash, it essentially fools the site into thinking it's a stronger password than it is. So there are very serious, serious dangers with this. Um, uh, I guess, um, so I, th I think that, that concludes. Uh, but just to add, um, so uh, our experience with Hashcat was excellent. We wanted to uh, just say how Im impressed we were with the uh, with the code and how fast it achieved its results. And we were quite surprised, actually, that we found people using password hash uh, on, these, uh, on these dumps. We thought we would end up with, with zero results, uh, but in practice, there were quite a, a, quite a surprising number of people that were using the, the technique. Okay, thank you.